If I wanted to go a very long distance, the first thing I'd do is grow the ruler to shrink the distance, then go the distance under that ruler, and then I'd shrink the ruler back. So when you talk about things like, oh, these things are behaving like nothing I've ever seen, well, there are a couple of things that I'm worried about if these things are real. One is, does somebody else know how to grow rulers and shrink rulers and grow watches and shrink watches, speed them up, slow them down? in order to get in control of the thing that we thought was space-time. The next issue is, are there multiple temporal dimensions? So Eric, your friend who's had too much coffee, believes that there are either six or four extra temporal dimensions, and whatever isn't temporal is spatial. So it's either four plus six or six plus four extra dimensions split between time and space. If that's true, Try to imagine extra dimensional engineers who have full access to something where there's no arrow of time. The only time there's an arrow of time is if time is one dimensional. If time is two dimensional, you have a whirlpool of time, which is either clockwise or counterclockwise. If it's three dimensional, you have a right hand rule of time, and there's a left hand rule of time. These are called orientations. My belief is that we may be looking at something that has access to either four or six additional dimensions. And again, I'm reading this off of a page of equations and notes. And so you know what they mean in physical reality. In other words, if this thing on the page is true, holy shit. On the other hand, if it's just some ge geometry, then you, you don't worry about it. You say, okay, well, extra dimensions. I can think in 17 or three or what, it doesn't matter. It's not that hard to think in higher dimensions spatially for people who do what I do. Almost none of us can think in multiple temporal dimensions. There's one guy at, in Los Angeles at USC called Yitzhak Bars, a Turkish Jew, who keeps talking about two-time physics. And I've spoken to him. But multiple temporal dimensions would be a decisive game changer in terms of changing everything that we know about the world. And what would be the technology that someone could use to access that? Well, that's the big thing. I know, I know, right? I know. You think about it. You're, you and I are both old enough to remember cassette tapes and uh, vinyl albums. Mm -hmm. On a cassette tape, you've played your favorite album all the way through, like Dark Side of the Moon, and you want to play it again. You have to rewind through every song you just played, and you hear, wee, 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 right? But that doesn't happen on an album. Towards the end of the turntable time, you would just, the stylus would pick up and it would skip over all the stuff that you didn't want to hear again and it would go back to some track that you did. Imagine you could do that with time. You didn't have to go back through time to go back in time. Do I even know what I mean? Not, not really. I'm sort of at the edge of where I can actually say things. But you see, all of physics proceeds from the time, from the assumption that time is one dimensional. We have this thing called deterministic propagation. So if you take quantum mechanics, there are really two rules. One is completely deterministic with no probability theory. You've got a system, you know its initial conditions, and you say, if I know the laws of physics, I should be able to figure out where this is. You know, I take this lighter, and I throw it up, and I catch it, and it described a parabola. Okay. Initial condition, propagation, I measure it. It's completely determined by the point of release. In quantum mechanics, you have the second thing called quantum measurement. And that is this weird probabilistic thing that nobody understands. Everybody says, if you, if you think you don't understand the quantum, you don't understand it. It's mind-blowing, blah, blah, blah. But the first part of it is where we're trying to fit gravity and when we quantize it. I don't think gravity goes in that slot. I think that what you do is you don't quantize gravity. You harmonize gravity. Gravity is the observer. We say, well, when you make an observation, well, who's doing the observation? Is Joe doing the observation? Is Jamie doing the observation? Who's doing this observation? Who has the right to use the second rule for collapsing the state vector with Schrodinger's cat and all entanglement weirdness? Well, I think it's gravity. I think that part of the story is, is that gravity is the observer through something called a pullback operation. And when you realize that, you realize that you don't naively quantize gravity the way you quantize everything else. In fact, gravity is the only field 
living on the successor to space-time, if I'm correct. There are two spaces called X and Y. All the cool stuff in here, the electrons, the quarks that make up everything that you and I are, is living on Y, except for the metric, the rulers and the protractors, which lives on X, which is how you keep gravity separate. And the unification is the unification of these two things in a structure called a bundle. Now, people will go over this, and I'm sure professors will say, well, this is what Eric was saying. Well, he's full of shit. No, 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 he's actually making a point. This story about space-time engineering, where you don't use the Einstein field equations because you're using the successor theory rather than... In the Einstein theory, the entire planet was pulling on you when you needed to go pee. And your legs, I mean, are obviously buff, you're fit. You just pulled against an entire planet to get out of your chair. And you won. That's how weak gravity is. That's how space and time is barely bent by all of Earth. Now, you're going to tell me about an Alcubierre uh, warp drive where, okay, no, here's what's going on. The ship is inside of this little bubble of warping. No, it isn't. If somebody's space-time engineering and they can get here from very far away, they're not using general relativity in the standard model, my friends. They're using a successor theory, and we have become pussies. We are not going to look at successor theories because we've all learned the lesson that everybody who tries to bet against the standard model loses. Everybody who bets against general relativity loses.